Hi Penny, thanks so much for your question and thank you so much for all the work that you do to support people in residential tenancies. Your organisation is so important, so thank you. We really understand the pressure that's on people at the moment. It's incredibly important that we address it. The fact is the Morrison Joyce government will do nothing to assist people who are renting. They just don't care. Wouldn't it be great to have an Albanese Labor government that does care and that is already committed to establishing a national housing and homelessness plan? The reason we say that it needs to be a national plan is because, as you mentioned in your question, it's actually other levels of government that have primary responsibility for some of the issues relating to, rent, to renting to residential tendencies that you've already mentioned. But we need all levels of government to work together on this. And what we need at a national level is a government that cares. So if we're elected, that's what we'll do. We'll also be putting less pressure on the housing market by making sure to have policies like help to buy, which I've already talked about in another answer. And of course, our $10 billion housing affordability future fund. But we can't implement these policies unless we form government. Oppositions can't determine the legislative, the budgetary or the administrative decisions of government. Crossbenchers certainly can't govern from the crossbench. What this comes down to is whether we have a Morrison Joyce government or an Albanese Labor government come Sunday. So if you want to change the government, I really want to encourage you to vote one Labor. We can kick out the Morrison Joyce government, replace them with an Albanese Labor government and start to get real change in this country. If you want change, the only way to get real change is to elect an Albanese Labor government. Hi, Paul. Thanks so much for your really important question. I appreciate it. Labor has long stood against discrimination and vilification of people on the grounds of their personal attributes. It was Labor that introduced gender identity and sexuality as grounds for anti-discrimination law at a federal level and of course at a state level here in Queensland as well. And at a state level, since 1991, we've had protections in our anti-discrimination laws against discrimination on the grounds of religious belief and activity. We also have in our state laws uh, provisions that prevent vilification on the grounds of religious belief. In my electorate, just across the road um, from, uh, from my electorate, I should say, we've got the mosque at Holland Park. That's a mosque that has been faced with vilification, threats, pig's heads, and I think most shamefully, uh, uh, some graffiti on the mosque that referenced the Christchurch murderer. Uh, it's a horrible situation. I know that we have other Muslim groups, Muslim uh, community groups and other mosques in our community as well, including one in West End. I think it's incredibly important that we have anti-vilification laws protecting people from vilification on the grounds of religious belief or activity. I also support very strongly provisions that prevent discrimination on the grounds of religious belief or activity. Uh, for example, there was a case here in Queensland where there was an incarcerated person who could not get a halal meal. That person should have protection uh, under discrimination laws against discrimination on the ground of religious belief and activity. And our federal anti-discrimination laws, laws that were substantially uh, brought in by Labor governments over many, many, many years, whether it's the Racial Discrimination Act of 1974 that was brought in by the Whitlam government or the Sex Discrimination Act of 1984 that was brought in by the Hawke government. And of course, there are others as well, age discrimination, disability discrimination. Our federal discrimination laws should have protections against discrimination on the ground of religious be belief or activity. And there should be anti-vilification laws uh, that mirror, that, rec that are similar to the existing anti-vilification laws we have federally about racial discrimination, racial vilification. There absolutely should be. And there should also be strong provisions and strong protections in federal discrimination law against discrimination on the grounds of sexual, of sexual orientation or gender identity. These things are fundamental. I know that there are some people in our community who've been claiming that you can either have support for LGBTIQ people or you can have support that prevents discrimination against people on their ground of their religious belief or activity, but you can't have both. I just don't agree with that. Here in Queensland, our laws have protected from discrimination uh, against people for either of those attributes for many, many years. We should be able to have both. And if I'm elected uh, as part of an Albanese Labor government, as part of a cabinet, I will always fight against discrimination and against vilification against people because of their religious belief or activity. And I will always stand up against 
discrimination against some of the most vulnerable people in our community, including members of the LGBTI community. That's my commitment, and I certainly look forward to getting the chance as part of an Albanese Labor government to end the absolutely opportunistic use of people's personal identities, beliefs and activities by the Morrison-Joyce government who have got absolutely no shame and no scruples, and instead to have a government that will stand up for people. Thanks so much for your question, it's really important. I know that people in the Hazara community, along with so many other communities, have been feeling the stress that comes with having a Morrison-Joyce government that is not only uncaring about human rights, it seems, uh, but has had a propensity, frankly, to take issues of oppression, of persecution, and use them for electoral purposes. It's really disgraceful to see people trying to just win votes off the back of refugees. And I think that what we need is a better government, a government that will take action to stand up for communities and a government that will take action to stand up for refugee settlement here in Australia. I'm really looking forward, if I get the opportunity to represent us not only in parliament, but in a cabinet, to making sure that we are speaking up for communities, that we are speaking up for human rights, and I'll continue to engage with Hazara community representatives should I get the opportunity to do so. Thanks so much for your question. Hi Mary, thanks so much for your question. And I wanna take the opportunity to say thank you to every single person in every community group and every neighbor who helped each other out during the floods. It was really amazing to see the work that went into coordinating volunteers, getting food to people, even just helping people charge their phones. So thank you to you and thank you to everyone who volunteered uh, and made really a massive difference to people's lives during those floods and in the aftermath. It is so important that we just face up to the fact as a country that we're going to face more severe and more frequent disasters because of the impact of climate change. I think people would be rightly furious that we've had a decade or more of climate wars in this country uh, because of things like uh, the toxicity of the climate debate, because of the polarisation in our community. Uh, you know, it's a real shame and I, it was really um, interesting, I thought, the other day uh, to see some of the debate that was happening about this, that we have had a decade of climate wars and toxicity in our debate in this country. An Albanese Labor government will end the climate wars through taking real action on climate change in a way that works with community and brings people with us. That is crucial. At the end of the day, what's the best way to take climate action? It's to change to a Labor government. What's the best way to end the climate wars? It's to do it in a way that brings people with us because we all know, and what we, because we've just lived it for, an, for a decade, uh, that if we have this continuous polarised toxic debate, then it's a blocker to action on climate change. So the first thing that I'd say about your question is that we need a government that will take real action on climate change. And the only way to get one is to voting for an Albanese, is to vote for an Albanese Labor government. Second point on the question of a sovereign disaster fund. The government actually set up a disaster fund some years ago uh, on the basis that it would have a dividend every year that would be spent on uh, preparation for disasters, mitigation of disasters. And you know what they did? They didn't spend any of it, not a cent. We got to the floods and we're in a situation where there just hadn't been the work done. Labor has already committed that we will very clearly take this and turn it into a disaster readiness fund that will actually deliver for preventing, and pre uh, for preventing damage, for preparing communities for disasters and increasing resilience and readiness. This is absolutely crucial for our area, as we were just reminded as recently as March. And I know that with the recent rains, we've all been feeling it as well. So if you want a government that's going to take action on disaster readiness, you need to elect an Albanese Labor government. The fact is, in our system, it's either going to be a Morrison-Joyce government or an Albanese Labor government. Right now, we've been living in a parliament, uh, we've been living under a parliament, I should say, where you've got a Morrison-Joyce government and there's some people in the crossbench and the opposition who want to take action, but we can't. The reason we can't take action is because we've got a Morrison-Joyce government. So there's no point in waking up on Sunday morning to three more years of Morrison-Joyce government and well-meaning people on the crossbench in opposition. That would be the worst possible outcome. We absolutely have to change the government if we want to be able to establish a fund that will be disaster readiness focused, and if we want a government that will take real action on climate change, not find ways to make excuses, not have its climate policy 
absolutely dictated to it by Barnaby Joyce, not have people in its own party room who think climate change is a conspiracy in the Bureau of Meteorology. I mean, there's just absolute nonsense going on in the Liberals and Nationals. And anyone who thinks that it's going to be easy to overcome that is wrong. We need your support. If we want to change the government, I'm asking you to vote One Labour. Please vote One Labour to get rid of the Liberals and Nationals so we can take real action on climate change and so that we can have a government that will establish a disaster readiness fund. George, on your question about power prices and infrastructure, these are really important questions. The fact is the government, through its underinvestment in our energy policy, in fact, you wouldn't even say underinvestment when they've had 22 different energy policies over their near decade in office and haven't really been able to land one, uh, has left people in a real bind. People are really worried about electricity prices in Australia. And also, of course, they've done nothing to address climate change and their failure to take real action on climate change has meant their failure to take action on energy has been exacerbated. So what are we going to do? We're going to have a Powering Australia plan. That plan will have multiple components to it. And the upshot of it will be that we will reduce power prices, we'll create jobs, and we'll reduce emissions through increasing the uptake of renewables. In doing that, we'll have things like new energy apprenticeships, of course, but perhaps the most significant part of the policy is to re rewire the nation's electricity grid that's tens of billions of dollars. It's a massive project to do, of course, uh, but it's important because if we can do it, we can put downward pressure on power prices that will help everyone, including businesses just like yours, and it'll create hundreds of thousands of jobs to do it. And of course, as I said, reducing emissions and uh, allowing the uptake of renewables. These things are so important because everyone in our community wants to see better action on climate change. They also want to see a better fair deal for small businesses just like yours. Hi George, one of the first things that Anthony committed to as the leader of the opposition was actually making sure that we do something about the fact that skills planning is not really working in this country. We've got a situation where we've got people not having the skills that they need for the jobs that exist now and not also being able to plan for the jobs of the future. So if we're elected, we're going to create a body called Jobs and Skills Australia to plan for those skills needs and to make sure that we're assisting people to get into the qualifications, the training, the experience that they need in order to work in those jobs. We've also made very clear that we are very unhappy with the deliberate underfunding of vocational education by this government over their near decade in office. We're going to establish 465,000 fee-free TAFE places in areas of skill shortage to address the training gap and to help fill, fill those shortages more quickly. And of course, we're going to address the damage done to the demand-driven system in higher education by the Liberals and Nationals. All of these things are really important, but the best thing that we can do to make sure that we're filling skills gaps and dealing with shortages is to listen closely to industry, to business, to better understand their needs. We'll always take a more collaborative and more engaged approach than the current government has. We'll never just be a top-down government. We'll always work with people. Thanks so much for your question. Hi, Dan. Thanks so much for your question and thanks for all the work that you do. Uh, it's really wonderful to have the radio station based here in Griffith. I'm really proud of it and I always like to tell people about you whenever I get the chance. Uh, I know how important it's also been through the pandemic to have First Nations voices broadcast through Australia. So thank you to you, but also to everybody from First Nations media uh, that are working so hard to make sure that we have those voices and making sure to stand up for and protect community. It's so important. Uh, you've had a really great campaign for federal funding and we really appreciate hearing from you on this on every platform that we possibly can. Labor wants to support First Nations media and if we're elected, we'll be engaging with you directly to talk about how we can do that. Uh, and for community broadcasting more generally, I also want to say how important that is. We've got a $12 million commitment uh, already announced to support community broadcasting in Australia because we recognise its value. So thanks so much for your question. Really looking forward to working with you. Uh, and most importantly, thanks for everything that you do to give people a voice. Hi, Selena. Thanks so much for your question. I know that uh, Anastasia Palaszczuk and of course, credit where it's due, the Lord Mayor as well, uh, worked really hard to secure the Olympics. And I know that people are really excited for the opportunities that are going to come with them. If we're elected, I'm really looking forward to being part of discussions uh, about how the federal government can play a role in relation to supporting the Olympics. Of course, as you'd know, it's primarily going to be led by the state. The legislation that's been set up to organise the Olympics is state legislation. Uh, and of course, it's the Premier that will be taking responsibility. I'm not part of the state government, but I would tell you what, how great would it be to have a Labor federal government that can work with those other jurisdictions in relation to delivering the Olympics? 
It'd be terrific to remove Richard Colbeck as sports minister. He's that Tasmanian chap who's also the aged care minister. You probably remember him uh, from quite notoriously skipping the COVID committee in January to go to the cricket instead, even though he was the aged care minister. It'd be terrific to, re to replace him with Labor's Don Farrell as sports minister. If we're elected, I'll be sitting around a cabinet table with Don Farrell and I'll certainly be working with him in relation to how the Olympics are likely to impact our community uh, and what the federal government can do in respect of that. Uh, just as we will be looking forward to working with the state government that will have the primary responsibility as the uh, lead uh, level of government in respect of delivering the 2032 Olympics. Uh, so thanks very much for your question. Really look forward to hearing a lot more from Weka in the lead up to those 2032 Olympics. Hi Jane, thanks so much for asking about this really important issue. I know it's really close to your heart, so thank you. Uh, we do need to have a government that actually understands the value of affordable and social housing policies. Right now, we've got a government that, cut, that actually cut the uh, capital expenditure component from the National Partnership Agreement on Homelessness when they were first elected. Uh, they actually took $88 million out of affordable and social housing back then. I remember that really well because I was the Shadow Assistant Minister for Preventing Family and Domestic Violence uh, soon after that. And of course, people would be aware that a lot of people who are seeking assistance in relation to housing are people who've left violent relationships and their kids. So it's really important that we address this and the way we can address it is by having a government that actually understands the value of social and affordable housing. People know Anthony's backstory, they know that he grew up in council housing, they would also know that many Labor MPs and Senators have had family members themselves who have relied on community housing services, on making sure that there are, there are supports there for people who are under housing stress. Uh, from my perspective, I actually want to see a government that cares about social and affordable housing and it's why I'm so uh, glad and grateful that Jason Clare has a policy of establishing the Housing Affordability Future Fund. This would be a $10 billion fund that will make sure that we have a sustainable way of contributing to the construction of social and affordable housing as needed every single year. That's what we want to do. We want to build social and affordable housing policy into the tapestry of the work of the federal government, uh, make sure it's there as part of what federal government does for communities. That's never going to happen under a Morrison-Joyce government. They just don't care about housing and they don't care particularly about housing in inner city areas. They couldn't care less and we need to remove them if we actually want a government that does care about making housing more affordable for people. We also need uh, to take action to address the fact that it's getting harder and harder for young people to buy their own home to get into the housing market. Uh, it's why we have our help to buy policy, which people would be aware is a shared equity model that assists people into buying their own home, getting into the housing market. And we also need to make sure that policies like this that can address home ownership, but also social and affording ha affordable housing can assist to put uh, some pressure uh, where it needs to be to reduce the rental stress on people as well. Because we all know that with particularly with the natural disasters, particularly with the uh, COVID pandemic and people heading north to Queensland, that we are under significant housing stress, whether you're an owner, a renter, or in social and affordable housing in our area, we all know that. The problem is that we don't have a federal government that cares enough about it to do anything about it. So if we're elected, I want to make sure that I'm part of a cabinet working towards dealing with these issues. I certainly look forward to people's support so that we can get rid of the Morrison Joyce government and get a government that cares about housing. Hey Bo, thanks so much for your really important question. I really appreciate it and thank you for everything that you're doing in our community. I want to just acknowledge that we do have, of course, a situation in our area where we are living on stolen land. As you say in your question, it's really important uh, to acknowledge that and that carries with it a lot of responsibility. Frankly, I don't think the federal government does anywhere near enough to stand up for First Nations peoples. And I think that part of the reason for that is because of the absence of institutional power for First Nations peoples in our national democracy. It's one of the reasons why Labor is so enthusiastic about supporting the Uluru Statement from the heart in full. Uh, as proposed by the signatories to that statement. We believe that by establishing a voice uh, and making sure that we go to a referendum so that that voice can be constitutionally recognised, we can actually help to allow a situation where our democracy reflects the needs, aspirations and, of in, and interests of First Nations peoples better. Uh, and that's by providing the arrangements that allow for autonomy, for um, influence, for authority to be exercised in democracy. 
Uh, we think it's really important to note that we're the only party that is fully committed to implementing the Uluru Statement from the Heart in full. Uh, and it's really useful, I think, to know that once we have that voice, there will be more opportunities to ventilate the issues, concerns and aspirations of First Nations peoples. In our local area, of course, you're absolutely right to say that so much more needs to be done. And it's one of the reasons I'm so looking forward to and hoping for the election of an Albanese Labor government, because not only will we deal with the big issues uh, of how to participate in this democracy, of how to make sure that First Nations genuinely get that voice and get truth telling and get treaty, uh, we will be looking very closely at the practical applications of those things as well. You mentioned healthcare, it's so important. We're lucky in our area to have such terrific community controlled organisations, Aboriginal community controlled organisations, working in urban Indigenous health. And if we're elected, an Albanese Labor government wants to strengthen and support uh, urban Indigenous healthcare services, we'll work with the National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisations uh, body Nacho to make sure that we are uh, developing and supporting opportunities for improvements for First Nations healthcare. We've made a big commitment to assist in the training of 500 new Aboriginal health workers for Aboriginal community controlled health organisations. It's so important uh, to grow that workforce because First Nations people deserve to be able to receive healthcare uh, from First Nations uh, peoples. That's what we actually need is community controlled and community led solutions, not top down solutions from a federal government. We've also made commitments in relation to renal health in both cities and regional and rural areas uh, and in relation to rheumatoid health as well. These are important because they go to the heart of uh, what we need to do to acknowledge that through this pandemic, we've actually seen those Aboriginal community controlled health organisations being at the front lines, leading, supporting the healthcare of community. That's so important and we need to make sure that those services are strengthened not weakened in the future. We also want to make sure that we have real commitments for uh, Aboriginal people and for Torres Strait Islander people across the length and breadth of this country. That's important as well in my portfolio of environment and water. Uh, a little bit away from West End, but people probably know that in the Murray-Darling Basin, there's really disproportionate under-representation of First Nations in water entitlements. We want to address that. And in fact, my first policy commitment as the Shadow Minister for Environment and Water, uh, alongside my commitment to double the number of Indigenous rangers and increase funding for Indigenous protected areas, was to commit serious money towards funding Aboriginal water entitlements in the Murray-Darling Basin, and also to provide opportunities, more opportunities, for Aboriginal nations to have a seat at the table, not just be consulted, but to be part of the decision-making in relation to water policy uh, down there. But of course, more locally, uh, we absolutely need to make sure that we're doing more for every issue, uh, confronting our community and, conf and confronting First Nations peoples, uh, members who live in our community. Uh, it's why things like our uh, Housing Affordability Future Fund will be important because you, I think you mentioned in your question the importance of looking at the cost of housing. Uh, it's why making sure that we have a government that's strong on healthcare will be important. It's why making sure that we have a government that's strong on education will be important. The fact is, unless we change the government, unless we get rid of Scott Morrison and Barnaby Joyce, we're going to continue to have a situation where people's aspirations are just not reflected by our national government. Uh, and when it comes to the impact of disasters on housing and of climate change more broadly, we all know that the only way we're going to get real action on climate change in this country is to change the government. The only way we can get action on climate change is to remove the Morrison-Joyce government by electing an Albanese Labor government. That's why I'm asking for people to give me your first preference vote in this area, because at the end of the day, we need Labor to win more seats than the Liberals and Nationals in order to remove the Morrison-Joyce government. I don't think any of us wants to wake up uh, to Scott Morrison's face on Sunday morning. I certainly don't. Uh, and I look forward to being in a position where we can change the government. Hey, Jimmy, thanks so much for your question about the pension. It's such an important issue. We really need a Labor government to stand up for pensioners. If we don't get a Labor government, then we won't have a government that stands up for pensioners. You would have to take my word for that. If you look at the objective facts, you can see that the Liberals and Nationals have tried to cut the pension and to cut support for pensioners in every single one of their budgets through their near decade in office. In fact, I remember when I was first elected, we had to fight tooth and nail to stop this government 
from cutting the pension in a sneaky way by indexing it only to CPI and not to the pensioners and beneficiaries living cost index. It was a massive fight we had to have, uh, but luckily Labor was there and we were able to speak up and be strong against these cuts to the pension. We also saw in more recent years a deal between Scott Morrison uh, at the time and the Greens Party where they sought to reduce pension availability for hundreds of thousands of pensioners in this country. It was an absolute disgrace and Labor spoke out against it strongly at the time. But if you want us to be able to take action on the pension, we need you to vote one for Labor. We need a Labor government. There's only so much you can do from opposition. It's more about stopping the cuts from the other side than actually making proactive change. But if we're in government, then we can consider the pension every single budget. And I'll tell you what else we can do. We can scrap the in-due debit card. This is the card that seeks to control how people use payments that they receive from the Commonwealth. Labor has said very clearly that we will make sure that that in-due card can never be used for pensioners. We will scrap that card. We want to get rid of it. We don't think that the Morrison-Joyce government should be controlling how people spend their money.